Welcome to the Kennedy Center Performing Arts Series. My name is Colleen Sinette Jennings, Professor of Theater at American University. I'm joined today by the director and members of the cast of the Gate Theater Dublin's production of Waiting for Godot that is being performed to sold out audiences at the Kennedy Center in Washington, D.C., and then touring to several other cities across the United States. Let me introduce you to our guests this afternoon. Alan Stanford, who plays Pazzo. Stephen Brennan, who plays Lucky. Johnny Murphy, who is Estragon, or Gogo. Barry McGovern, who is Vladimir, or Didi. And Walter Asmus, who is the director of this production. Gentlemen, welcome. I'm guessing that some of our viewers may have read the play once or are about to read the play. This is certainly one of the most important plays in the Western theatrical canon. Help us out a little bit. What's at the heart of this play? What is the message? What is the playwright trying to communicate? A long pause ensues <laughs> in a true <laughs> Beckettian fashion. <clears throat> I suppose the great thing about this play is that it tries to discuss uh, the human condition in, in a very realistic uh, but very simplified way and tries to go to the heart of what being on this earth with fellow human beings means. And it, uh, it is a reduction of what that experience is uh, that, that makes it uh, something wonderful and something that is endlessly discussed because it is, uh, as an old English critic Harold Hobson once said, the play is not an appeal to reason, nor is it a puzzle. To search for its meaning will reduce to futility the acutest intellect, <laughs> just as yielding to its exquisite ordering of ideas, its echoes and its associations will exalt the humblest spirit. And uh, in that, like, like most great works of modern art, uh, you don't put a, an essay beside every picture and explain what it's about. You allow the uh, audience to engage with it and to respond and to feel uh, its echoes, its resonances, and uh, in, in Godot there are a great many, as you can imagine, uh, for, for everybody. It's an expression, you, uh, what I find beautiful about, poetically beautiful about it, just in its form and structure, is that within, within its walls, as it were, it seems to examine all the potential that life can offer you. And it is an, an expression of life in that the process of life is a process of waiting, uh, which, is, which he also brings down to an absolute simple crystallization I mean, he does, uh, the, the, that Pozzo presents and that, uh, that Vladimir picks up on, which is they give birth astride of a grave. The light gleams an instant and then it's night once more. Uh, the question I suppose that one could say is that the play asks is what happens in that brief moment of light? You, are, you get born, you live, you die. What do you do in the meantime? You wait. But we share the things but that we, we do in the meantime, which is we all have to eat and we all have to go to the loo. <laughs> <laughs> they are things we all share yes. in, that, in that gap. In that brief mm. moment. Yes, yes. But we also should try and have as much fun as possible, of course. Of course. Yeah. And that's what the, the two boys uh, try and do in their waiting. In their inventiveness. They yeah. come up with with things to do while yeah. they're waiting. Great. The child, the child that is in them is, is very evident that men, uh, no matter how great or pompous they may become, uh, as in, in Pozzo, in Pozzo. Um, they remain needing children, that, that, that the needs of a child still remain in all of these characters, yes. no matter how great or how poor or humble. Walter, in terms of tackling this as a director, I know that you worked with Beckett and you were a friend of his, what insight did that give you into the play in terms of knowing the man? Seeing, watching him working, uh, you find out that he uh, was very precise, that he, he had visualized his play uh, extremely precisely and uh, that he tried to put across the music of the play, and in this respect, uh, I think it was very important to have worked with him. He never gave explanations, as my colleagues do here. It's <laughs> very intelligent what they say about it. He never did that himself. He simply relied on the structure of the play and the text, and uh, he 
he said, you find everything in the text. If you read it uh, thoroughly, you will find what it is about. And uh, for, for me, it was uh, this uh, very important thing that uh, we uh, worked on about the timing on the timing on certain technical as aspects which came together in a very complex structure and uh, became a piece of music altogether by this. Yes, the, the, the technical demands are, are quite substantial. Um, uh, would you talk a little bit about that from the point of view of actors working with that very precise timing and the music of the play? Um, yes, it, it is just like a piece of music that <clears throat> if there is one slip up with dialogue, it's like a piece of music that's just gone flat. Yes. And uh, it, it always reminds me of uh, jazz. And I know a lot of musicians who actually, actually love Godot because of the beats, the rhythms, the... Uh, the rondo, let's go, we can't, why not, we're waiting for God. And that is uh, the attraction for musicians. But just picking up on the point that uh, Stephen made, it, it's an amazing play in that the way it affects different individuals. I've met more people after the show who would give their individual uh, response to it or how it affected them. And uh, that's the beauty of the piece. I mean, people will make political parallels and uh, human parallels, obviously. And uh, I met a guy over in Buffalo years ago. I was telling Alan. And I met him at the bar afterwards and he said to me, do you know that scene when you reject Vladimir at the end of Act One? And I said, yeah, and he just started to cry. And I realized then, well, I guessed that his marriage was having problems. And that was his uh, identity with the piece. So people get hundreds of different things out of it. Sure, sure. And Barry, I think you were talking earlier about the playing with the audience, and depending on their reaction, it also affects the timing and the music of the play. How so? Well, yeah, I think that's the same with every play. And every, the thing about live performance is that every night is going to be slightly different, because it's not just what you do in the rehearsal room. It's the interaction between the players and the audience. And sometimes you get a very dead audience who don't seem to be responding to the play. It doesn't mean they're not enjoying it. They may be enjoying it very quietly and seriously in their own way. And you get another audience like the one we had last night, which was very responsive to the comedy in the play. And it certainly took me aback, because we've done this play so many times. But there were certain lines last night that people laughed at that never, they never laughed at before. And um, it is difficult sometimes to time the rhythm of the piece, because I agree with, with Johnny and the others. It's like a piece of music. All, all Beckett's texts are, uh, are like music, even the prose texts. But um, yeah, just every night's different. So that's what makes it so interesting. It's not like taping something and it's done. It's because it's live. Every performance will be ever so slightly different. We'll all be. It's the interaction between all the people on the stage, the interaction between the players and the audience. So it has its own dynamic each night. There's a sort of uh, fundamental truth about theatre, I suppose, that a good play should, ha should represent itself to every individual watching it. And you should, in, 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 you know, in, in the best of all possible worlds, you should be able to take from a play its truths as they apply to you, uh, whether it be Shakespeare or, 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 or whatever. The thing about this play that, that I always find and, and have found working on it over the years is that there's something so essentially pure about each moment in the play that it can apply with great simplicity to anybody mm. if they listen to it. Um, uh, as Walter was saying, uh, you know, that, that Beckett said himself, it's all in the words if you read it, if you actually listen mm. to it. It will, anybody coming to this play, it's almost like a, 
a sort of theatrical process of confession, come to it with an open, pure heart, or in this sense, an open and pure imagination, and it will, it will embrace you, because whatever is in your experience, you will find within the play. It's quite magic. Well, let's take a look at a clip now, uh, because I think there's no substitute for actually seeing what we're talking about here. So we're going to take a little bit of a clip from Act One, and then we'll come back and talk about it. Thank you. So that was a clip that uh, took us up to uh, the carrot. Um, can you talk a little bit about the nature of the script and working on it because there are so many patterns and so many repetitions. What does that do for you in terms of being actors? You talked a little bit about if you lose your way or if you just slip up a little bit, it all falls in. What particular attention do you have to pay to some of those patterns that are found in this text? You have to listen to it. As, as actors, you, you don't just say it, you must listen to it. You, it, it, it must, it's not just, it's not four actors giving four individual performances. It's, it's, it's a, I suppose it would be, it's like playing a, 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 a Beethoven string quartet. It's, it's a parley of instruments um, and a parley of imaginations as well. And if you, as you, as you, you listen and, and, and watch those sequences of dialogue going, the, the, there is a game of language, or a game of language as mu or music as language being played. Uh, and the repetitions, um, as Johnny said earlier, it's the rondo of, uh, of you know that, that particular repetition each time it's said will have a freshness and a newness um, the words must constantly be new it is always in the moment as Walter constantly said to us for many a long year it is only in the moment um, so that they're not repetitions each moment is new each moment is fresh each moment is new. you know Gogo rediscovers why he has to wait again and again and again. The past is forgotten. It is only in the moment. It is only now. So the use of the language in that, in that way is, is um, desperately important. That, but, yes. There's another language implied. It's not, not only the text and the words. It's the language of movements. It's the physical language, which was very important to Beckett. He designed it, uh, he talked about it being balletic. Uh, he designed it very neatly. So every uh, approach or every uh, crossing and so on is worked out uh, mathematically or almost. And in terms, of course, uh, of timing at the same time. So there are long stretches, long walks and very short uh, approaches and in terms of rhythm, faster, slower, and so on and so on. And all these movement um, experiences which match the, the text and the music of the text. And that is something, he, he was, for him it was very important to, to have the audience recognize these repetitions in precisely the same way. Of course, they have to be filled by the actors at every moment, but uh, the echoes and repetitions will have a, an effect for the audience to, to go deeper into it, to recognize it, and to connect with uh, an earlier situation in the play, and so on and so on. So there are two basic uh, languages, one could say, in the yeah. play. Well, what did you do to prepare for this? Because you as a director have to interpret what's on the page, and, and it obviously means a lot to you to make sure that you're, you're following the playwright's wishes in terms of what he intended. So how did you prepare for the mounting of this piece? Oh, I very much uh, relied on his uh, preparations, I must say. Uh, I follow his uh, structure. I follow his sketches in this uh, uh, production very much so. Mm -hmm. But of course, it changes. It loosens a little bit. You can't do it mechanically. You can't repeat mechanically. It has to be d d to be lived. And uh, and um, looking at the play, you will find out it's, uh, there are very basic uh, human relationships are implied. You see, and um, 
God, it's all about human relationships, it's about love, it's about friendship, it, it's about uh, frustrations, it's about aggressions which arrive in the situation of waiting. We all know that, we experience that uh, at the supermarket cashier, you know, that we can't wait. We uh, experienced it here today, <laughs> we were very patient. <laughs> and, and so these are, these are basics which we are very familiar with. And uh, I like to uh, speak in terms of my own experiences uh, with the actors too. We, unlike Beckett, you know, I like to, to, to find examples, to have exchanges with the actors and uh, share my experiences, my life experiences with them and they do it with me. And by that, we, following the pattern of the play, we find our very personal music in it, I think. I love that expression, very personal music. Can the actors talk a little bit about what it's meant for you personally to do this wor uh, role, whether it's in terms of your craft or your insight into the play? What have you taken away from this on a personal level? Well, this is a play I've been saying for 18 years that I'll never do again <laughs> because I spend 35 minutes bent double and uh, then stand up and do that amazing speech, which is a kind of a piece of verbal jazz. Yes. Um, and incidentally, in that speech, the entire play is encapsulated, just in case you want to. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you can work that out for yourselves. Um, but in, in, uh, in, in, uh, in, in, in coming back to the play all the time, it, it, it has become for me, I suppose, as close as I've got to a religion in the sense that the play um, uh, is, is brutally honest about life. I mean, it is an existentialist tract. The facts are there. Man is seen to shrink and dwindle, waste and pine, and the earth is an abode of stones. And uh, th th that is as brutally honest as any man can be about uh, this earth. And uh, uh, I, I love it for its honesty. And I love it, I, I don't love it for the pain it gives me. <laughs> it's yes. like my little crucifixion every night. Yes. But I mean, even on, on that, um, talking about the physicality of the play as well, I, I tried to change the physicality of Lucky. Because Lucky is, 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 is a, a beast of burden and he's, he's, uh, he's incidentally the only guy in the play with a job, which may be why he's called Lucky, um, <laughs> but, but I don't think so. Um, but I couldn't do it. I tried, I tried standing up and tried, uh, I said, I can't do this anymore, I'm getting too old. So I, uh, I tried standing up and, doing, and, and, and I found you just couldn't do it that way. Mm. There are ways that, that uh, are physically dictated within the piece. But it, it also has this just wonderful attraction in its honesty, in the beauty of these two lost little men, mm. in the pomposity of this lost little man, mm. and this man's ability to see the bigger picture and to accept it. Mm. And I think Sam uh, reputedly said about Lucky that which, uh, I mean, as Walter said, he didn't like explaining things, but the closest he came to explaining why Lucky was called Lucky was that he had no more expectations. Mm. Peter O'Toole said he was called Lucky because he had nothing to say in the second act. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, well, he's only got two lines. It's just that one of them is very, very long. Very long. <laughs> is it, I mean, I, 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 what Stephen said about it, it it's almost, uh, to a degree, religious. I found, over the 18 years of playing the part, um, to me, Pozzo, the aggression of Pozzo is where I started from, and the vulnerability of Pozzo is where I've reached, that he is perpetually vulnerable. Um, in other words, the, the aggression is still there, but it comes from a different direction. Uh, and that's something I, su I suspect you have to discover by doing it <laughs> for 18 years. Um, you know, we all work as actors in, 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 in various plays and various productions, and, and uh, we usually have a, sp a relatively short space of time in which to come to terms with a particular part or a particular play. We may only have a, a, a month or so to study it and a few weeks to rehearse it and, and maybe a, a 10 or 12 weeks to, 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 to complete the, the run of the play, and that's it. When you do something like this, that you keep revisiting with the same group of people for 18 years, it does take on a different, I suppose, um, it becomes a, a different 
nature of acting, a different nature of theatre. It's, it's not simply a production. It's almost a life journey. Uh, so you start to perceive the play very much through your own experience, very much through uh, where am I now, uh, what, you know, in my own life, in my own career, and what, 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 you, 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 you st each time you come back to the play, you suddenly have a whole new vista. But Barry was talking earlier about, you know, you, you see a movie when you're young, and you don't see it again for another 30 years, but when you do, it's a different movie. The movie hasn't changed, you have. Um, so doing the play has been a wonderful voyage of discovery myself, for me. Yes. Uh, just that capacity to re-examine thoughts that you had and thought were absolute and discover aren't. <laughs> well, since we've heard from, from Lucky and Pazzo, now would be a great time to see this second clip that we have which features Lucky and Pazzo and, 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 and uh, uh, will give you a little bit of insight in terms of what these actors are talking about when they confront their roles. Let's show that clip now. <coughs> Thank you. That was an outstanding uh, clip and also involved uh, both of you as well. Could you pick up on what we were talking about before, about the personal stamp that this play has made on you or in your lives? I, I have a memory of uh, going back 30 years ago at least in another life. <laughs> and I came upon this play and I could not make head or tail of it. I didn't know what it was about, but I needed the work. So as they say in Ireland, I chanced my arm. And I was in rehearsals for it, thinking it was hopelessness, pessimism, no way out. And a friend of mine happened to be in the auditorium watching this rehearsal. He was playing Pozzo, actually. And I looked out. And there was tears running down his face. And I met him later. We went for lunch. And I said to him, very politely, I said, what were you <coughs> laughing at? He <laughs> said, it is hilarious. And I thought, my God almighty. I never saw fun in this. <laughs> and then when you see that side of it, now you can move in a different direction. Yes. And uh, I think it's 75% fun and 25% tragedy. And the two balance each other and play off each other. And uh, on a, a personal level, it, it's very difficult to say I mean, sure, you you um, you mine yourself to find out how I delivered this line, what this section is about, uh, the the um, relationship with Vladimir, and I suppose unconsciously you call on things in your own life you know, uh, to, to give you that insight into what you're trying to achieve. So uh, it, it, that's as best as I could explain it, because uh, it, it's, it's just such a fabulous piece of work that it, it's very difficult to put your finger on it, right. you know? That's why Johnny's uh, such a great estragon. He's just described the slowest penny drop of the century. He sees it now. Well, and thank you for saying that you couldn't make heads or tails of it because yeah. I think people sometimes are afraid to say, I don't know what this means. Yeah. So it was great to hear your, your journey. What about you, Barry? Oh, I mean, I don't know what to say except I concur with what Johnny said. I mean, I, I first saw the play when I was, um, I first saw it on television actually when I was quite a, a young boy and it, it just did, it just struck a chord, I can't say any more than that. Um, it's an old black and white television production in the 60s and uh, then I saw it, uh, saw it when I was about eight, 17 again on the first time I saw it on stage and then I got involved, I was in various productions of it myself over the years, I 
play three parts actually. <laughs> Lucky Estragon and now Vladimir. But um When are you gonna play the boy? Uh yeah, <laughs> just just pots on the boy to go, that's right, yeah. Um I don't know what to say, except it's it's just as Stephen rightly said, it's kind of like a, a parable of life, you know, and um it's 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 music and it's just very, it's very hard, as Johnny said, to talk about. It's very hard to put your finger on it. it, it um, as Beckett once said about Joyce's work in, a, in an essay when he's a young man, he's talking about Finnegan's Wake, or work in progress as it was at the time before it was published. He says, um, it is not about something, it is that thing itself. And in a way, Beckett's work is all that, you know? It's just a poet who wrote in prose, a bit like Joyce. I, I always think of him as a poet or a musician who happened to write in, in prose. It is that difficult. It, it, you know, the, the question you ask is incredibly simple, and it is actually impossible to answer. But if you if you look at the, the, the clip we were uh, the, the showing a moment ago, uh, the, there's a sequence in it uh, of Pozzo attempting to explain something, and uh, there you see, it, it is in the piece itself that you see the the truths that you yourself will take from it, because every one of us at some point in time has felt the need to be precise about what we say and the frustration of being unable to find exactly the right way to say it, which is exactly what we're doing right now in trying to answer your questions as, as positively as possible, and the frustration of those who want to actually ask questions and are not allowed to, uh, who want to actually uh, simplify the problem for the, for, 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 uh, of the interrogation, but, but are being denied that opportunity. It's in the work itself. It is in, and um, Walter's answer was probably the most um, intelligent because it came straight from Sam Beckett, which is it's there in the work. Read it, look at it, open yourself to it, and you you will fit into it. You your own imagination will fit into it. I think you know. I, I, I suspect that all of us sitting here would concur that there's probably infinitely too much analysis and not enough experience of the piece. It is not a piece to analyze. It is a piece to experience. I think the, the great thing is really that uh, over 16 years, generations of people have taken to this play and still do. What uh, fascinates, me, uh, fascinates me is really that uh, there are young people who never get out frustrated out of this show. They always have an insight, they always have fun, they understand infinitely more than we perhaps understand or, or know about it. Also. Last night, the laughs, from the beginning on, you say there were different laughs and so on. Yeah, but I, I, there were young people laughing about certain things a generation before didn't laugh about. Mm. So I think it goes on in this way in a very positive uh, historical sense that uh, young people understand more about their lives, about the situation, about the world, and they get more and more from this play in their own understanding and experience with the world. Because it's all in this play, the problems and troubles and the wars and the, 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 the loves and so on, it's everything is contained in this play. That's what it makes so magic. We were talking be before we began the, uh, the program. We were, Johnny and I were talking about this. I mean, one of the notions that sort of came out in discussion when we were rehearsing this time, you know, the notion that uh, at the time Beckett wrote the play, that Europe was was uh, littered with refugees, um, people who were displaced, had no home, no identity, nowhere to go, and were simply waiting for something. Um, I'm not saying Beckett wrote the play about that. What I'm saying is that that fits in to what Beckett wrote because he wrote about everything. By making it so simple, it, it fits every scenario. But uh, Johnny was making the point that uh, there's a scene where, where, where in the second act, Lucky and Pozzo come on, they fall over, they're lying on the floor. And for nearly 10 minutes, Pozzo is just simply saying, help. <laughs> and the two of them debate it. They debate helping. And it's terribly funny. But then if you think of something like uh, 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 10, 12 years ago, Rwanda, where, or anywhere in the world, where genocide or, or, or hunger, Darfur at the moment, where there are people dying and are saying, help. And the United Nations and the Western governments and the governments of the East debate how we will help them, should we help them. If we help them, would it be correct to help them in this way or in that way? 
but spend all this time talking about helping and not doing it. And while that's happening, the poor people on the ground are still saying, help. Now, I don't believe Beckett actually real. I don't think any man could realize that what he was writing was so universally absolutely true. I think uh, had he set out to write a play that was universally absolutely true, he never would have written it. I think he wrote something with a degree of inspiration about human nature and the human condition um, that the world fits into the play, not that the play fits into the world. Mm. Excellent. Well, well, speaking about that and also speaking about young people, I got a wonderful uh, quotation here that I'd love for you to respond to. A student says, it seems that waiting is what we do. We wait for class, we wait for tests, we wait for college acceptance, for graduation, for vacation, for nicer clothes, for new iPods, for whatever. If this is true, does Beckett mean that waiting gets in the way of what we really should be doing with our lives? Well, that's a good question. But I, I, I think it's, it's not so much waiting. Of course, it, the play is about waiting. He said it about, it has to do with hope. This boy hopes for an iPod. This boy hopes for getting into college and so on. So he's full of hopes all the time. You have to, and you have to work for your hopes somehow. You have to live up to the point where it may happen and not giving up. And that's what these two guys do, basically. They don't give up. Even when the boy says he doesn't come today, uh, Vladimir says, but he will surely come tomorrow. I mean, he, there is this hope he will come tomorrow. He doesn't give up. There's one moment where he said, I can't go on. And then he looks back and and uh, he, he, as if he's scared of, uh, of himself, and he says, uh, what have I said, you see? And then the boy arrives, a little boy arrives from somewhere, and there is the hope, and then the dialogue with the boy. So I think all these, uh, we are, it's, uh, I, I would say it this way, I'm not waiting for, for something better to come, or something worthwhile to come, something which I wish to come. I hope for it. Yeah all the time. And, and is it this, this optimism that's at the heart of the play that enables you to do performance after performance and stick with it as long as you have? Moi. <laughs> optimism. You're the great yeah. optimist in the play. <laughs> yeah, I suppose Vladimir is the great. I mean, Vladimir is, um, he's associated with, with the tree and the sky. In this particular production, at the end of each act, where one character says, well, shall we go? And the other says, yes, let's go. And it's reversed the other act. Um, Walter has us, indeed Beckett probably had them, looking at uh, Vladimir looks up and then there's the, cur the, 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 the blackout and Estragon looks down. Estragon's associated with the earth, with the stone, with worldly things, with food, with needs. Uh, Vladimir's associated with the head, with the tree, the mind, the, the, the optimism. Um, but Estragon has also had a bit of learning somewhere in the past. He, quote, he misquotes Shelley, his ode to the moon, and he, um, poet, you know, read the Bible. He's, he's, he's been there, he's done that, he's read the books, and he's dismissed it all as not rubbish, but not relevant to his situation. Vladimir is the more optimistically naive in a way, but at the same time, he's like a kind of a mother to him. He gets him when he's down. But there are times in the play where Vladimir's down and Estragon is like the mother hen and says, here, you look out there and so on. So they're, they're not completely, they're, 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 what was the great thing that Beckett once said so to Peter head. Woodthorpe? He said, it's, it's all about Peter Woodthorpe who played the original Estragon in the first English language production in London in 1955. He was in the back of a taxi with Beckett one day and he said, he said, Sam, everybody's asking me what this play is about. <laughs> Can you please tell me what this play is about? What will I say to them? He's only 23 at the time. And he says, Symbi symbiosis. Tell them it's all about sim <laughs> symbiosis or whatever. Uh, so he didn't know what that meant, but he told everybody it was about symbiosis, which of course is interdependency on one another, which of course it is about. In one word, that's what it's about. So, but of course it's about so many things, you know? But that's, but that, that's repeated in the Pot So Lucky relationship. You know, Lucky begins the play as a slave and ends up as a servant. He, uh, Pozzo begins the play as, a, uh, uh, as the character of domination, ends up as, as, as uh, you know, in, in the wheelchair or on the Zimmer flame, flame being led along by, uh, you know, he, he, Pozzo, Pozzo to that extent has gone through the whole gamut of, of life and has become utterly dependent. He is absolutely without function unless somebody's there to change his, 
his incontinence pads. You know, he's, he's, well, two yet, of the great symbols in the play, physically, for me, are that I, I, I put the rope in his hand, my rope around my neck, and I... That? I mind him. I'm his, I end up as his minder, but I look after him, and it's a human thing. Yeah. And the other beautiful one is that they hold hands. He takes him by the hand, and he brings him. Yeah. I mean, I saw a, a dreadful uh, picture in a paper one time of a little seven-year-old boy with his little brother in some, I don't know what it was, a Mary of Devastation or Famine or something. But the two, he had him by the hand, and the two of them, the, God, the size of them, they were just walking into nothing. And every time they take hands and walk somewhere, they're going on. Those little boys had the instinct within them to, tr to seek, to, to go on. And uh, that's, that's at the heart of their relationship and their relationship. Yeah. Our says, need for one another, supporting one another, going on. Potser says, right, you know, w w what do you do when you fall far from help? We wait till we can get up, then we go on. It's that, we will go on, we go, uh, uh, it, it, is, it is that hope, that the possibility that if you go on, there is always hope. Um, even parts so blind, useless, lost everything, no, not, lost even a sense of time. That that, I, that is part of the human condition. That's what makes us survive. What makes us survive in time of war, in times of famine, in times of personal distress, we go on. Um, which is, you know, for my mind, the strongest phrase in the whole of Beckett. I mean, uh, Barry's uh, does a, a most magnificent uh, one-man show based on uh, the uh, the trilogy, uh, finishing with the unnameable, and that single phrase, I'll go on. It sums up, really, the to me, the core of the... Uh, Stephen was talking about the, the religious experience of it. That's it, for me. Um, that what makes us what we are is our belief that we can go on, no matter what. Well, I was struck very much hearing your, uh, your Irish accents, because I've seen only American productions, and it, it struck me that, there's, that perhaps there's something... Uh, of the native Irish character somewhere in this play that Americans might not be aware of, in perhaps in the nature of the comedy and the nature of the message that's being sent. Can you talk about that a little bit? Well, Is that I true? I would feel that to Walter, <laughs> because he is the man who has had to put up with us <laughs> in this. <laughs> And I, I'd love to know his answer about that. I think that. the first two lines, nothing to be done, I'm beginning to come around to that opinion. I think that's very <laughs> Irish. What do you mean by that? I don't know. But, but that was my experience. Really, in Ireland, the people laughed about this line. They never laughed about in Germany about it, you know, in Germany. And it is love. It was love last night and so on. But didn't and, you, and you had a voyage of discovery with this production, didn't you, really, in terms of discovering its Irishness in yes, its language? Yes, yes, yes. I, I think it has yourself. to do with the lightness and so on. It comes by, it is a sort of, of the nature of these actors, the language. I have the impression, you see, very much so. And, and uh, my experience with the French and the German is quite different, and it's much heavier, and, and this is almost colloquial, what they are capable to do rather than saying important lines, you see, to each other. I mean, must have to do with the Irish. And the Irish, the Irish are very talkative. They talk a lot. I go out of that. I don't know. Once talk. Barry Not starts to talk, you know, he, you can't, it's very difficult to stop him. <laughs> <laughs> see, and and I, I think that has to do with Beckett too, of course, as, as, a, as a poet and so on. This uh, talkative nature, which is in the play. They talk all the time, of course, yeah. There are certain, and don't ask me what they are, but there are certain, you know, certain moments, certain lines, um, certain sequences in the play that are idiomatically Hiberno-English. Uh, I mean, it's not Irish, it's not the Irish language, but it's the, 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 the phrasing, the, the, the sound, the sense of, of phrases become colloquial for, an, for Irish actors that would not be so for others. Um, he also slips in the odd little Irish phrase. I mean, in Endgame, for instance, um, you're a bit of all right, a smithereen. A smithereen is, uh, is a decidedly Irish phrase. Uh, he, 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 when he, I mean, we must remember that he didn't 
he translated the play from his own French Correct. into his English. Yes. And his English was not the English of England. It was the English of, uh, the, uh, 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 of Ireland, which is a slightly different thing. Not quite, to Europe. Quite a different thing. Quite a different thing. <laughs> Are there other parts of this play for you as actors that feel like home, that feel like something that's part of your culture and custom that an outsider might not necessarily get? Well, hopefully they will get it, because otherwise we're not doing very well as actors if they don't. <laughs> oh, the, yeah, I mean, the, the, the play, though, it is written in Irish English, because um, he just used his natural ear. He used his French to be specific, because he was using a foreign language, but he used his natural uh, language, which is Irish English, uh, in, its, in its English version, uh, rather than translation. Um, but it's... Uh, I've forgotten what I was going to say now. What was I saying? What was I saying? I'm sure it was going to be very, very fascinating. Something about use of language. Oh, yes. His Irish ear. Oh, his Irish ear, yes. And his uh, Irish eyes, which were not smiling, or seldom. We'll have a conversion. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me then ask you about the names of the characters, and, and I'm sure you would also be helpful here, Walter, because of your relationship to Beckett. Why Vladimir? Estragon, Pazzo, why, why these names? <laughs> I have no, no idea. idea. <laughs> <laughs> Vladimir no idea. means ruler of the world. Did you know that? No, I didn't. Vladi, ruler. And Near Estragon means tarragon, doesn't it? He was originally called Levi, Jewish name. Levi. Levi. In the whole first act, it's Levi in the manuscript. Then he comes calls him Estragon in the second act, from then onwards. Estragon from... Pazzo means a well mm. in yeah. Italian. A well. And lucky is lucky. Yes. Well, there are, there are different theories and different uh, interpretations, but uh, on the other hand, if he, if he, in Lucky's speech, there's a Peterman, and there are names in Lucky's speech, and uh, a Fartoff and a Belcher. No, but that's and, German. And Stone man. Yes, and a and, uh, German actor who played Lucky he looked up his names in the dictionary, and he said, oh, I found out about about Fartoff, I found out he was some sort of cider. No, like I said, no, no, that's English. It means to fart, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and Belgium means to belch. <laughs> and he had theories, you know, I had read books about this actor and so on. So, uh, the so only name I think that actually means anything in the play is the name I, I give in reference to Pozzo losing his pipe. I've lost my Captain Peterson. Because ha Captain Peterson were very famous pipe makers and tobacconists in Dublin, and still there. And they make beautiful pipes, and I smoke one of them in the play. It's the only real name in the play, I think. This is all dissolving to something very strange, I must yeah, say. Yes, <laughs> what about, about Mr. Albert? Do we go there? Well, now, Mr. Albert. Who <coughs> indeed is Mr. Albert? Yes, well, he worked for a farmer called Albert, didn't he? No. Picking, he did. Picking grapes, grapes in the macaron country. Oh, he sounded. Well, well, that's new to me. I didn't know. You, were, you, well, you, you think know. you know everything about Beckett, but you don't. If you were wrong, <laughs> did you know that? And Albert. Somebody once told me no, it was the first not, name he could think of, Ellie. beginning with the letter A. Oh, Martin. <laughs> no, uh, oh, could have been. It was. It was Bonelli in in Roussillon he worked for, but it's actually A Bonelli on the bottle. So maybe it was Albert. Hmm. Told you. <laughs> there you are. Well, well, Walter talked a little bit about his preparation for the production. What did each of you do as actors to get yourself ready to... Bend over a lot. <laughs> bend over a lot. Do you, do you have to, physically, you have to work out or stretch or... Oh, I stretch a bit just to, to get... It's really your ass that holds you together, so I've got a really tight ass <laughs> for this production. Yeah. Well, he had. He had. He's got slack over the years. <laughs> yes, when people stand behind me and say, I'll give it to him, I get a bit worried sometimes, but... Um, no, you have to be, as I say, I've never used so much energy doing nothing before in my life. Yes. Because uh, after about five minutes like that on the stage, I start to make patterns on the floor with my sweat as it drips off my floor. Yes. Yes. Um, well, Johnny's you, the only one that works out, actually. Yeah, Johnny's in the gym every day. Every day. It's funny, you know, <laughs> when, uh, when we came to do this originally, Barry and Johnny had both worked on, on, on different productions of the play. I'd never done the play at all. Yes. And I'm, uh, uh, so I, I had Still no haven't. idea. Still haven't really. I've not, you know. <laughs> but uh, I, I, th I, I was meeting Walter for dinner. Do you remember this? And, oh, and, and, uh, uh, no, it was the Caprice. 
No. Oh, I'm sure really everybody like doesn't really matter. It's really 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 <laughs> I really find this extraordinarily interesting. But I had no idea. And I'd, you know, I'd read the play and I'd read the play and I'd read the play and I'd seen the play and I, had, I felt, you know, I, I need to get something. And I came up with this, because uh, I'm a great believer, come up with a theory. <laughs> it doesn't matter if, it, if it's true, so long as you've got something to start from. And I came up with this theory. I, I, I sort of redefined this. And Larry, you'll remember this. We, I talked about it during the, one of the festivals we did. And somebody wrote a piece about it as a, a, a serious proposition about the play. But I came up with this theory. I thought, OK, uh, Beckett would have been aware of the theatrical touring tradition of Ireland in, 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 in the early part of the 20th century. Uh, there were a lot of touring theater companies and the old style actor manager. Uh, and I just got this notion that that uh, Gogo and Didi were two actors with no script but an infinite capacity to improvise. Whereas Pozzo was an old style actor manager who had his script and he had his props and he had his, and he had his ASM. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it just gave me some, something to just grab on. And I discussed this uh, with Walter who I think sat opposite, uh, opposite me at the dinner table, uh, thinking, this man is totally <laughs> insane. Why is he in this production? You know? But it gave something to... Oh, and it's extraordinary. The things you, you sort of grab onto that will give you... It, it's sort of a, a foundation course yes. that you can build on. Uh, uh, and, and, and eventually you forget about it. It gets buried underground. It's, it's, it's gone. But it was just and you've been hamming it up ever since? I've been hamming it up ever since. <laughs> in the old style. In the old style. And also in Endgame. <laughs> Barry, what about you? Any particular way you prepared yourself? or Not really, no. I mean, we often get asked this question. Um, I just, um, I don't mean this in a facetious way, but I, I just treat it like, I, I don't mean just another part. I mean, it's a wonderful play and a wonderful part. But you approach, I mean, it's so long ago since I actually learned it, although some of them might disagree yeah. with that, <laughs> um, that, uh, you know, I, the process of, of doing it, Originally, I suppose you just learn the lines and go for long walks is what I do. I prepare and go into rehearsals and do it. But I, I suppose having seen so many productions and read a lot about it, you assimilate what you need to assimilate and you dismiss what you don't agree with them. You're always learning new things about it. I mean, today I um, just learned something about the play I never knew before. But, you know, it, there's no mystery to it. It's, 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 it's kind of 90% perspiration and 10% inspiration, like yeah. any, any work in the theatre. It's, it's, it's hard work and you just get on and do it. But it's been, it's been a joy to do. And uh, it's been a joy to be They're with these boys. They're not characters you can last. go and research. You know, if you're doing a Shakespeare, I mean, most of them were based on some sort of historical background. And many other plays are, you know, but where do you... <laughs> yeah. And there is you, a thing, too, that we're often asked in America particularly, and... Um, it's to do with the whole Stanislavski tradition and so on, and um, how do you actually research the, the sort of the nature of your character and what you did for breakfast and so on and so forth. It's not like that. It all happens when it happens. There is no real background to this character. It's not naturalistic in the sense. It's not like doing, say, an Arthur Miller play or something like that. It's completely different. It's a different, I suppose it's like abstract painting as opposed to figurative painting or... There are certain types of music which, I mean, music is the most abstract of the arts, but at the same time, there is some music which has a certain type of traditional form to it, and we can um, recognize it as such because of the tradition and so on, whereas there are other things that are much more abstract, and just it just is what it is, and you, you assimilate it or you don't. Mm -hmm. And I think, in a way, Beckett is like that. You just trust it. And this, people are always asking, you know, there's this notion about the Beckett estate or doing things exactly the same way, that it's no free, there's no freedom in, for actors in doing Beckett. I, I find totally the opposite. I mean, you can have an infinite amount of ways of singing a particular song, an infinite amount of ways of, 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 of playing a Beethoven string quartet or whatever. They're all di they're playing the same notes, but each production of Waiting for God or Endgame or Happy Days will have a different set, uh, will have different actors doing it in their way. And if, you, if you're true to the spirit of the piece, there's an infinite amount of variety in the way you can do it. So, but to go back to your original question about how you prepare for it, I, I, I don't really know how to answer that question other than everybody will prepare in their own way. There's no mystery to it. I mean, there's no one way. Really? There's always a mystery to it, in a sense, Yes. <laughs> with dealing with, with art of any kind. But the more you talk about it, the more highfalutin it gets. You just get you back see, to actually have... doing the play. You discover it in the rehearsal room, basically. You discover the dynamic for this particular... It will never be the same with us guys doing it. It will never be the same as other guys doing it, and that will be there. Even if two of us were in another production mm -hmm. with two other guys, it would be a different dynamic. 
I think it really stands in the way to create a character, you know. I have taken notes over 20 years, don't create characters. I mean, in the traditional th sense, in the method acting way, for example, I think it would be fatal to create characters. You can rely on the text, you can rely on the relationship, on the basics, you see, and then you have to open yourself and that's what the actor have to do, open yourself to the script and to the text and to the implications of the, of the, uh, the text and, and the play. And uh, otherwise, for me, it doesn't work at all if I uh, ask the actors to create fancy characters, you see. Even Pozzo, we can, we can say Pozzo, my, my impression always is he, he tries to join the wrong party, you see. So he imposes on people. It's like somebody coming into a theater canteen and he is, let us say, a lawyer or a businessman and he wants to make friends with theater people, you know. It is mostly fatal. He is meant to <laughs> fail, you see. And that's, that's what Pozzo does. He fails all the time to be friends with them, to, to, to pass his time and so on, yes. and uh, but that is not uh, that doesn't mean that we have to make him a, a lawyer, you know, as a character or whatever that would be. I don't know. Yes. Yes. I think we, I mean, <coughs> without really wanting to be facetious, the, the 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 simple answer with this play is you to, to paraphrase Noel Coward: you learn the lines and don't bump into the tree. It's a that's what it is. When you, when you know it, and you've learnt both the words and the music and the dance. That's what you do, and and your you, as, as Walter says, your your own instincts, your 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 own self will inform the rest of it. No, oh, Beckett belongs to the world. That was the thing I was trying to think That's of when I lost my train of thought. We so finally got that. Beckett belongs to the world. It doesn't matter if you're Irish or English or what you are. Yeah. Yes. It belongs to the world. Yes. Well, thank you so much for being here with us today and having seen the production and knowing the kinds of physical and, and mental demands that it makes on all of you to have taken the time to talk about it, to talk about what is essentially impossible to talk about. <laughs> we really appreciate because this is an amazing play and you, you make it accessible to, as you say, to generations of people who will uh, enjoy it. So thank you so much for being here with us today. That's all the time we have for today. Thanks for tuning in to the Kennedy Center Performing Arts Series. I'd like to thank the artists who've taken the time to be here and share with us. I'd also like to give a special thank you to the George Washington University School of Media and Public Affairs for hosting us today. If you'd like more information about this program or other programs in the Kennedy Center Performing Arts Series, you may contact us by using the email address on the screen. We'd love to hear from you and answer your questions. Thank you for being with us.